on the line with us is uh, John Pavlovitz. He's a, a writer, a pastor, an activist. He's the author of three books, including Stuff That Needs to Be Said, which is the name of his popular blog. And his latest, uh, If God is Love, Don't Be a Jerk. And uh, I thought this would be a fascinating conversation to have. John, welcome to the program. Uh, Tom, thanks so much for having me. So so great to be with you today. Thank you. So so, uh, tell us the, the the basic premise of your book. Where are you starting with this? I'm starting with the question of whether or not someone's expression of their personal faith yields a more compassionate or less compassionate world. And if it doesn't lead to a more compassionate world, what's the point of it? I'm speaking to a, a number of people in our country right, right now who claim Christianity, but who don't seem at all burdened with the teachings of Jesus. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I did an extended rant the other day, a couple of days ago, about Matthew 25 and how, you know, nobody seems yes. to be paying any attention to the, the one place in the New Testament where the disciples came to him and said, how do we get to heaven and hang out with you? And he said, here's what you do, you know, feed the hungry, uh, heal the sick, care for the, you know, care for the, 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 the refugees, uh, visit those in prison. And, and uh, so, so exactly. how do we bring back the golden rule? I mean, it's, it's not, this is not just something embedded in religion. This is something that is, is larger than that. It's, it's, it, this is cultural as well, is it not? It is. I think it, it's a matter of making empathy trend again. It's about really lifting up compassion as one of the critical elements of being human, and that's regardless of whether you're religious or not. And so the work I do is trying to reach people in that place of empathy and to begin to imagine that someone else's experience of America or life or the church is not their own and to endeavor to understand that experience so that they can be agents of healing and kindness and, and generosity. How, how do you see that happening? I mean, we, it, we've, this is not, obviously, I mean, we could go back to the Crusades, we could go back to, uh, right. it, it, to, back to arguably to the crucifixion. I mean, this is not the first time that we have seen violence in the name of religion. Um, and, and it seems to be a recurring theme, frankly, in organized religion throughout the history of the world. Um, how do we make that cultural shift here in the United States? Or, or, or for that matter, you know, I, it seems like the largest Christian denomination that has, or Christian group, uh, you know, uh, there are subsets of it all over the place, um, that, that have embraced Trump and have embraced racial hatred and have embraced um, you know, uh, the antithesis of the golden rule have been the white evangelicals. How do you That's speak right. to these folks? I mean, you're a pastor. How do you speak I, to these folks? I, th I think where I'm always trying to reach them is from their fears, because what Trump, what the evangelical right has done is leverage all those fears, those phobias, those prejudices, and created a faith that needs an adversary, that's, that always requires a battle posture. And if I can get some people of faith to understand that they don't have to be motivated in that way, that they don't have an enemy that's always encroaching, and they can understand that there's an interdependence that they have with other human beings, that they're not in competition, that someone else's gain is not their loss. And when we can begin to do that, and they can have a faith that is viewed through that interdependence and that, and that place of empathy, they're going to naturally want to be collaborators with people and not in competition with them. But built into Christianity is this idea, and, and, and many other religions as well, but you know, we're speaking here of Christianity, I suppose, um, is this idea that there is an incarnation of evil in, in Satan or Lucifer, or whatever you want to call him, or it, um, and that, it, that, that incarnation of evil is an opponent both of, of Christ and of average people. And that, you know, that seems to be, in my mind, what's informing so much of the evangelical movement. I mean, they're, they're literally um, calling people who don't believe in their politics evil. Right, and that's always been the, the easier way to get, have a shorthand to want to caricaturize people and place them in a you know, dualistic setting, whether they're the, the saved or the damned. And that's what religion at its worst 
has trafficked in. And if you can uh, strip away some of that and help people understand the story that they've been raised in, you know, these are people, many of them who have been raised for decades with a, uh, an angry, vengeful God who is out to squash them or is out to um, squash other people. And so that when you can, when that aggression is built into your faith story, it's a really difficult thing to remove. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Read Jeremiah or Isaiah or or uh, right. uh, Joshua. I mean, it's but but the the um, you note in the book that hell is incompatible with a loving God. How do you make that argument to Christians who are still using hell as a as a uh, a tool to control behavior? You know, uh, uh, little Johnny, don't steal from the store. You'll go to hell. Right. Well, I, I, it started for me in, in examining Jesus' teaching to his disciples on forgiveness. And Jesus is essentially saying, every time someone asks you for forgiveness, you need to provide that for them. And the idea of hell is really not applying that standard to God. It's, it's God saying, I can get to the point where I'm so fed up with you that I am going to exclude you for good. And that, to me, is just not, it's not simply something that the character of a God who is love could possibly do. And, and if God is God, then that God is going to out love and out forgive and out, you know, wait us. And so I came to the conclusion that a God who knows me intimately then knows exactly my fears and flaws and is not going to hold those things against me for eternity. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 this is, uh, you know, I've, I've often uh, talked about how uh, it's not that, that some of these churches frankly would not want me and it's I mean, it's just, you, you talk you talk you talk in your book about how american evangelism or evangelicalism is built on this faulty premise that god is a white cisgender heterosexual man born in america raised christian votes republican um right. ha, you know the, the, the patriarchy and hierarchy have to the best of my recollection always been part of uh, both Judaism and Christianity. I mean, this the, this goes back thousands of years. How do you challenge that? I think the best way you do that, Tom, is to go back to what are the teachings of Jesus? What was the immediate community that he was building? What was the in the wake of his life? And that was not about consolidating power, and it was not about dictating the laws of the land. It was this movement of the street. It was relational, and it was about making sure that everyone had what they needed. And so if we can keep trying to refer to that and move people away from a Christianity that has market share or that has d political dominance, it was it has had that for history, but it's not meant to have those things. It functions at its best when it is um, interpersonal, when it is a, a lower level, street level thing where people are made, there's less suffering in its wake, there's less hunger and less need. Yeah, yeah John, you've, uh, we're talking about John Pavlovitz. You, you, um, you are calling to the better angel, to our better angels. You are, you are uh, asking for the best of us, you know, in our, in our religion, and I, I salute you for that. Uh, his new book, If God is Love, Don't Be a Jerk, Finding a Faith That Makes Us Better Humans. Um, let's talk about, for a moment about America and politics, John. You, you uh, write about this at length. You've got your blog over at uh, johnpavlovitz.com. Uh, um, and, and I believe you've got another blog, do you not? Or am I missing that? Uh, no, that's the only one that I know of. That's the one, okay. Uh, John Pavlovitz, uh, J-O-H-N-P-A-V-L-O-V-I-T-Z.com. Um, you, you talk about all Americans know January 6th was an insurrection. Decent ones care. What's your point? Mm. Well, I, you know, I started, I've been a pastor for over two decades, Tom, and what I started to realize midway through that was, hey, the thing that I'm a part of actually seems to be perpetuating all these injustices and all these phobias. And what, what I've seen ever since I started to speak more explicitly into matters of politics in 2016 because I realized we were at a place of very specific urgency. And I'm, with 81 percent of evangelicals voting for Trump, I really needed to explicitly declare as a white cisgender heterosexual pastor in America that these are the values as I see them of Jesus. And then this is this thing, this Republican theocracy that's trying to happen. 
And so you look at something like January 6th and you see people, professed people of faith, completely denying reality in front of them. And if we can't have a, a, a love for, the, for elemental truth, for objective reality, then we have no business talking about morality at all. But doesn't objective reality sometimes fly in the face of religion? Oh, for certain, and I think that's when your your faith needs to come to bear upon the situation. So I, I know so many people, I talked to thousands over the past few years who they're still Republican because they've always been Republican. They're still in the Christian church because they've always been, even though they know someone like Donald Trump is antithetical to the, the life of Jesus. And they know that the Republican Party has become something that Jesus would not recognize as of him. And yet they're they're compelled to stay there. And so sometimes we have to make hard decisions. And I'm always trying to call people of faith to that, to say, if I have to break away from my family, my church community, to, to live my faith more explicitly, then I need to do that. In your blog, you're talking about, you know, the, the first year was a, a COVID problem. The second year, 2021, the year that we just completed, uh, was a problem of uh, lack of vaccination. Uh, you want to first expand on that a little bit? I think that the pandemic, which was actually when I started writing this book, Tom, was in March of 2020, and the, the growing disbelief that a group of people of faith were the most resistant to masks and then later to vaccines. And there is such a cognitive dissonance there that I, I can't fathom. But to see so many people who seem to be waiting for this vaccine that could get us out of this mess and yet now they are doubling down on refusing it and yet still claiming their people of faith and as we'll talk soon th that they're pro-life and how you can be pro-life and yet anti-health and safety is um, something that I don't think many of the Christians we confront on those issues are capable of even verbalizing what their thought process is right now. What, what, is the, what is the sales pitch that is being made in the evangelical community? Uh, you know, I mean, I've, I've heard the, the kind of the variation on snake handling, you know, that God will protect us. In fact, it might, mm -hmm. this might even be a way of testing our faith. Um, that's, that's been a big one, actually, over the last two years in many of the uh, charismatic churches. Um, what, are, what, are, uh, what about that and these, some of these other arguments that these right-wing pastors are making to, to argue against getting vaccinated and against wearing masks? Yeah, I, think, I don't think, m m for the most part, people aren't, doing, aren't refusing it on those grounds. Those are probably the more extremists, but the people who are sort of in the middle, they, they've just been convinced to invest fully in tribalism, that their, their identity is so caught up with whether it's Trump or the Republican Party being right or winning, that they're, that they're willing to set aside objective data and what they probably know to be true. It's almost a, a self-preservation of their, their religious or their political ideology and that they're willing to really literally die for it. And that's the saddest part is talking to friends and relatives. You know, we talk about all these issues and it's really the relational fractures of all this stuff is, is really huge. Do you, do you think that, uh, I mean, obviously the flock has been led astray. Um, my recollection is that in, I think, the fourth chapter of John, um, or first John, um, there was, there was uh, a rant about beware of the ravening wolves who are coming, coming to you disguised yeah. as sheep. Uh, is that Donald Trump? I think it's, it's a complete... Um, characterization of really the religious right and what it's done to create over the past few decades something that is predatory and yet adored by the people who are being preyed upon the most. So I, I see Donald Trump as embodying it in a, in a very different way than most politicians have. I think he has had the audacity to speak the things that they, that they believe but would never say because of some thin veneer of decorum. John, uh, when I was a kid, uh, in fact, actually, when I, when I was a t in, in, uh, right up until the mid-70s, in my recollection, um, probably the first 25 years of my life, uh, there was this movement called the, the uh, pro-life movement, which was, uh, and they used to go out and, and demonstrate and protest and things, 
And what they were demonstrating and protesting against was the death penalty. Um, the, then, of course, you had 73 and Roe v. Wade, and within a couple of years, the anti-abortion movement had hijacked that, that term that had been used so, for so many years by the anti-death penalty movement. Um, what, in, in your mind, what does pro-life mean? How should it be reinterpreted uh, or re-understood by both people of faith and, uh, you know, secular folks who are, uh, you know, uh, wrapped up in this political sh scrum that we're in the midst of right now, uh, where, where this phrase is being used uh, very often as a weapon? I've, I've always taken the phrase pro-life and, and tried to restate it. And so for me, the idea of pro-life should mean, mean for humanity. And if I ask someone if they're for humanity and they say yes, and then I'm going to show them the ways that humanity is in jeopardy right now, whether that is health care or immigration or the environment or education, and I'm going to ask them to show me where the legislation that they support and the, and the politicians that they uplift are – are really coming uh, undergirding that humanity in those ways because usually what pro-life means to a religious person is i'm going to be against abortion it's a form of easy activism i can feel righteous but not really have to change anything about my life not confront my privilege not have to really do anything to love people that i don't like and so when i begin to push back in the other areas of what it means to have a consistent pro-life ethic i think it falls away for so many religious people and yet you yourself have uh, uh, taken kind of a partisan position. Uh, back in December, you wrote a blog called Why I've Lost Respect for My Republican Friends. Mm. It, it's, a, it's a kind of an honesty about the people who I have, who have been my tribe. You know, being a pastor for 25 years in the local church, these are people that I've been to mission trips with and prayer meetings and churches and all sorts of life events and i know what they believe i know what they've seen and experienced about the world and i need to keep speaking into that and telling them how disappointed i am to see what they've embraced and the way that they've been able to rationalize a really a callousness and a cruelty i think that's the story here it's not just a differing uh a differing view on on something or a different definition or different do you, think, uh, legislation. do you think it's important that we start confronting folks like this john we just have 20 seconds left i'm sorry yeah i think if we can't if we can't disagree with if we have to have empathy if we have to have cruelty in everything we do i think it's never gonna it's never gonna build anything redemptive we have to have lenses of compassion that see our differences with and, and we seem not to i mean you know whether it's debates about uh, uh gender or whether it's debates about immigration or whatever it may be it's it's uh, so unfortunate uh, a great book if god is love don't be a jerk finding a faith that makes us better humans by john pavlovitz his website john pavlovitz j-o-h-n-p-a-v-l-o-v-i-t-z.com and also john pavlovitz on twitter john thanks for dropping by great talking with you